Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome, welcome, welcome to another educationalizing, crack filled, and banter driven episode of Three Blokes of Ball and Board. And yes, 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 I am still alive and well. I just end up, people send me messages all the time. Thank you. I am alive, I am well. I just end up producing most people's shows nowadays. But Monday, every fortnight on a Monday, myself and Kigo, and then on a Wednesday, uh, once a fortnight, it is the Three Blokes of Bull and Bod Show. Thank you to everybody who has sent us messages in recent times about our plan changes over the next 12 months and your support for that and ideas and suggestions. More to follow in that over the next couple of weeks and couple of months. So on tonight's, tonight's special allows me to be able to do one of the things I like to do on the Three Blokes of Bull and Bod our flagship show, the original show, if you like, um, to be able to look at different things, stories that are, I think, that need to be told. That we just need to scratch the scratch. I know we're doing tonight, by the way, is scratching the scratch on the surface of the story of this club. And the guests tonight are going to tell us a little bit about that and their own thoughts and what they've been involved in. So it's it's it allows me to be able to do that. So I'm grateful to them. We'll introduce those in just a second. We are, of course, telling the story of Exeter Chiefs. Uh, rugby and uh, the journey of 10 years and some of the things that have happened to that. And for anybody who's not next to Chiefs fan and is watching for the first time, you are Kehomira uh, Falcho, I guess, Gonna Mira Mahogot, 100,000 welcomes and very thanks for coming to watch the show tonight because this is a story that you need to be aware of. It is, un it is unsurpassed. Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, I don't think people anywhere yet have understood exactly what this team has achieved uh, and i'll tell you why as i bring the guys in very very shortly as to my journey which started with them back in 2013 on a very very bitterly cold uh freezing winter night in the european cup of sandy park where we were well hosted but leinster still won that's the only time i mention it tonight otherwise the guys will come back on again joining me first of all um is as you know you can see the uh, the logo up in the top corner, and we put a little bit about them on before. Uh, we like to promote uh, small local businesses and people who are developing. Our fan and five tonight, so we've got six or eight minutes, uh, five fast sort of paced questions. A guy called uh, Guy Roberts. Guy is a young entrepreneur, very, very inspiring man who runs Locker Stash Rugby. He's going to tell us all about it. Guy, welcome to the show, brother. How are you? Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I'm I'm very well. Um, I'm glad. Um, I'm I'm sure the people are going to want the starter out of the way and get to the main. Is um, I'm sure there are four or five very interesting lads to um, to tell. But yeah, we're we're doing okay, Joe. And um, it's beginning to feel a little bit like home in it. Beginning to see more and more of this studio. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll always be welcome. We want to be part of your journey with you as you go. So tell us a little bit about yourself very briefly. And um, what is Locker Stash Rugby Mate? OK, so, um, yeah, well, you got my name right for a start, which was good. Um, yeah, so I'm 19. Um, I'm based in Devon myself. Um, we Locker Stash Rugby is a community interest company. So for people that don't really um, understand the whole lingo, it's halfway between a charity and halfway between a business. So all of our profits go straight back into causes within grassroots sport, particularly rugby union and rugby league. So we look to sponsor anything from we work with the Children's Hospice Southwest. So we do projects that take terminally ill um, children and their families and the families of um, bereaved who've lost loved ones to go and watch rugby union for the first time in hospitality in comfort giving them something back after um either losing or you know having a little bit of respite from everything that's going on all the way to a really successful partnership at the minute with um, newport gwent dragons so we fund their homeless and disability provisions um which is covid spoil a little bit but um we were gonna have a big festival we had some great star names lined up to come and play an invitational game for us but um and we've also got a bursary scheme going so currently um working hopefully next couple of weeks is going to be announced baby rhino um ellis genji's coaching company so we're going to be working with pupil premium students to um provide their camps over christmas so we put our fingers in a lot of pies um joe that's probably the easiest way to describe it um, and um, we're in a crude sense rugby's equivalent to Salvation Army, so we're there for everybody um, from the top of the tree all the way down to the bottom, trying to scramble up. 
Good. How does it work very quickly when you go to clubs? How, yeah, how do you fine, cool. Locker Stash Rugby website, www.lockerstashrugby.co.uk. Um, you head on over. We've got anything from Ulster Kit to um, Namibia to Exeter Chiefs. Um, we've just done a stash drop, actually. So there's some new Chiefs stuff on there now. Um, and basically, um, you just go on just like any other online shop function um, and um, you buy it and we post it out to you. You can also donate stuff and in exchange you'll get a credit voucher. And it just is all about upcycling old kit because that's something that's not any good for you anymore. Um, either you've grown out of it or you've kind of fallen out of love with it. Um, maybe a gem for somebody else. So um for something that's just going to sit in your wardrobe and gather dust, um, you know, it can be fundamental in us um, developing the futures and the outcomes of the elite players that you're going to sit in the stadium and watch in years to come. So, um, yeah, that's 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 it. So, um, aside from that, we've got pop-up shops. So, if you're associated or affiliated with a grassroots rugby club, we can come along. Um, it's all COVID secure and COVID friendly. And we basically bring a cross section of our shop along with us um, at discounted prices. We come and say hello um, and you can buy as little or as much as you like um, and have a chat about how we can kind of help your club um, and uh, individuals kind of flourish um, in the coming years. So, yeah, um, that's, that's how you can get hold of us. Cool. And you've got a whole pile of ambassadors, haven't you, for different ranges across we, the people? We do indeed. Unfortunately, these boys are yet to sign up, but um, I'm sure I'll get them on the dotted line at the end of the show. Um, you can work your magic, Joe. But yeah, no, so um, anyone from currently, we've got Sam Matavesi, um representing Fiji. Um, a lot of, we do a lot with the um, services. We've got Ed Pasco um, from the Royal Navy. Carl Moyle currently playing at mm-hmm. Gloucester. Um, and yeah, we've got some star studded names, especially in the women's game, as we're all about kind of promoting the that and it's up and coming. So um Gwen Crab, um big shout out to that Welsh International, so um at Hartbury and also um Rona Lloyd and Sarah Bonner who are playing um in Scotland as well. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Very briefly, what's the next steps for you for Locker Stash? What's the next the- steps? So obviously, mentioned Baby Rhino and the coaching, but we're looking for as many ambitious clubs that we're not just for the elite. We're not just there for players that are going to be an ex Gareth Steenson. We're looking for players who play because they love it. So if your club is in need of anything, whether it's kit, we have our own kit line, so we can do um, kit for you at subsidised rates. Um, we're looking to do that. We're looking to um, launch our sevens team. So at the minute, um, we're compiling all of our young ambassadors and um, scouting around the country for all of the the talent to put on a platform um, and a plate to say, look, here you go. Here's the next generation. Um, Sign them up. Um, if you can. So yeah, that, that's the next steps. And then hopefully we're looking more towards education, growing the women's game um, and also more of a, an all round provision. So making sure that the elderly and um, marginalised groups can enjoy rugby just as much as anybody else. So we're in talks with Wasps at the minute as well. So fingers crossed um, our community links will um, be coming very soon there as well. So yeah, Excellent. busy, busy bees. Yeah, absolutely. And just remind us again how old you are. So um, I'm I'm 19 years young, but I'm I'm going on 90 because as soon as I log out of this, I'm going straight to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, good man yourself. Listen, always great to see youngsters making a thing. Absolute pleasure. So anybody wants to know more about the community interest uh, company, uh, which is halfway between the charity and the company and the profits they go they they make after all the sort of running costs and stuff go back into. So, to- Grassroots Rugby, go to lockerstashrugby.co.uk or alternatively, social media outlets, Instagram, lockerstashrugby and Facebook, lockerstashrugby. So depending on what age bracket you're in, pick you, pick and choose which one you like. But yeah, so we're, and we're always, we're always welcome to an email chat as well. So um, happy days. Great. But anyway, absolute Thank pleasure, you. Joe. I shall Thank love you and leave you. Goodbye, we'll you. lovely people. Bye, bye, bye. Good luck. Thanks for that. Ladies and gentlemen, there we go. Uh, Gary Roberts, Locker Stash Rugby. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, introduce each of these. And by the time I finish introducing these, they want to meet themselves. Our first guest tonight is for, originally from Caerphilly. And, and of course, the, 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 the great thing about this is they'll point out if any of this is wrong. Um, the first guest tonight is from Caerphilly in Wales. Uh, he played for the Welsh regional side, the Dragons. He joined Exeter Chiefs in 2009. He's played 200, he played 244 games, scoring 
137 points uh, and was capped by Wales at under 18. He can play uh, fly half, centre, wing or full back. He is Phil Dolman. Phil, good evening. Evening. How are you? I'm good, mate. Thanks for taking the time and great to see you again, mate. Seems like it's ages since we last saw you on the show, mate. Yeah, cool. It was a long time ago. A lot's happened since then. Yeah, it has, mate. It's been a, it's been a strange old year, but thanks for making the time to come on and to, to share with us tonight. Right, so joining us tonight, our next guest, to make sure I get them in the uh, in the right order. Uh, he's originally from Harare in Zimbabwe. He played for Western Province and Stormers in South Africa. Seven years, I believe, at the Exeter Chiefs, played 91 games with 70 points. That's uh, no mean feat. He was the centre. He's represented England at senior level. He is Don Armand. Don, good evening. <laughs> good evening. Did you say I played centre? <laughs> Blanker. Did I say centre? Oh, Blanker. That's, that's like, you, wow. should have, you should have played centre. Flyer. Flyer, mate. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. There you go. Well, there's a beer I owe you for a start, mate. So, no, no, <laughs> Somebody will pick up. Mate. I'm only giving people something to engage with anyway. Don't harm Yeah, that's me. fine. I'll play I'll play centre if you need. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The centre in the back won't be that too happy about it, but we'll uh, we'll see what he says <laughs> when he comes on. Uh, our third guest originally from uh, Lisbon and Northern Ireland. He originally played for Ulster. Um, he joined the Chiefs in 2010 and he played 217 games, scoring 140 points. Uh, he should do in the position he plays, though. Um, he represented both Irish Wolfhounds and Ireland at senior level. He is the flying centre, Ian Whitten. I don't know about flying, but I'm, I'm a centre. Like, uh... well, hopefully, hopefully, if Rob's watching this tonight, he'll be like, yeah, actually, you should be moving a bit faster. Big Joe's right, so he'll be pushing you a little bit harder for next week, mate. So there we go. Uh -huh. Good, you're welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for taking the time. No worries. And, and last but not least, this man originates also from uh, Northern Ireland, from Dungannon, uh, which will please uh, uh, David Topping, our White Walker one who's watching. Um, he played for Cornish Pirates, uh, where he made an immediate impact. He joined Exeter Chiefs in 2008, kicking 24 points against Bristol in 2009 to help the Chiefs win uh, the English Championship and promotion to the top flight. Uh, he played 290 games, scoring a whopping 2,531 points. That's fly, that's fly off. Uh, he represented Ireland at underage level and uh, probably the only man who should have had 50 or more caps, in my humble opinion, for the national team. He is the inimitable Mr. Gareth Steenson. Gareth, good evening. Good evening, Joe. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. Oh, I'll tell you what a plethora of people. Uh, genuinely a pleasure, gentlemen, to uh, kick off the show. There's all sorts of chat going on in our private... Uh... <laughs> I should be sharing some of this. I'm going to keep all these for after some of it. I write my own book. <laughs> That's uh, very, uh, very, 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 very Right. So, extra to Chiefs. Those people who um, are, uh, who, why would anybody around the globe who wouldn't be aware of who extra Chiefs are? But for those who don't know a little bit more about the background, uh, the club, Exeter Chiefs, were promoted to the uh, English Premiership, the top flight of English rugby, for the first time in uh, ever in 2010. Uh, since promotion, the Chiefs have become one of the leading clubs in the Premiership, uh, probably the lead club, um, uh, you know, for, for many people, being crowned champions twice in 2016-17 and more recently uh, last season in 2019-20. Um, they reached a further three finals in October 2020. The Chiefs won the European Champions Cup, which is the top prize in the European Club Rugby Union for now defeating the French club Racing 92. Um, interestingly, and here's a real one for rugby nerds, Exeter are the only club to win the top four tiers of English rugby, winning the National League 2 South in 1996, uh, National League 1 in 97, the uh, RFU's Championship, which is the second tier in 2010, and the English Premiership, obviously, in 2017 and 2020. They've also won the Anglo-Welsh Cup twice, most recently in 2018, and the European Rugby Champions Cup in 2020. As long as they don't beat Leinster, I'm happy to see you score more and more and more, gents. There is some story behind Exeter, it's fair to say. And again, I go back very briefly to the time when, in 2013, and the thing that uh, the thing that uh, endeared Exeter to me was it was um, was the fans. It was the feel that you went. It was like a proper rugby family. Now everybody knows that in a professional game, where you know money dictates everything, that it's difficult to to try and build a feel. And we've seen that with certain clubs around the globe, where it's all money buy stuff. It's part of part and part of it. Don't agree with it myself. And um, 
but I, myself, and my girlfriend Jill, we were uh, we were very, very looked out, uh, well looked after um, by by the Exeter fans, and it just gave me a feel that, regardless of it being a corporate organisation in a professional sport, you could just feel that what resonated through the ground and the fans was the same that resonated through the club. Um, you know, the fact that we won was by the by, um, but it was it was a great feel and something that I followed with the team ever 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 since. Um, Gareth, what, what was it like coming up from, it uh, starts off coming up from sort of the championship? Were those aspirations, because you'd sort of risen and risen and risen. Um, you've got a coach who has now been there 26 years. You've got a chairman who sort of creates all this together. But what was it like when you eventually got to that point of coming through from the championship into top flight? Well, I suppose at the start, really, it was about, no one had been there before, really. You know, we'd had a handful of boys that had come in and played uh, Parmesha Rugby. Not even a handful, probably two or three. So uh, a lot of the guys that had come in had basically been told uh, you probably weren't good enough somewhere else. And uh, The whole feeling around the club was about enjoying it. And just it was all brand new. So it was all about making sure we were better whenever we come out the other side. So we would have went to games, um, played away and lost by 50, 60 points, but would have still celebrated it, you know, because hopefully, you know, would have been better on the other side of it. So um, it was always a steady building block. It never really felt like we were in a mad rush to get anywhere. Um, it always just seemed to be that as it's gone over the years, especially over the last 10 years, we've taken the right steps at the right time, which has allowed us to be in the position we are now. Mm-hmm. That's good. So, what 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 was it? Uh, what's your perception of 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 things? From if you like, it's almost uh, the first third from sort of that that ninety six sort of uh, you know going onwards, and then was it two thousand and nine that you joined them? Yeah. Um, so, what was it like for you? And almost on that that cusp of that first year going forward. Um, how did you feel sort of, you know, being part of that team from then and then moving forward in championship into premiership? Um, it's, it's hard. I think we just kind of felt as if we were right kind of in the here and now. Well, that's the way I treated it anyway. We kind of didn't, I didn't look too far ahead. I don't think the club were looking too far ahead. Obviously, they had plans to get promotion and move the club upwards. But I think, you know, for me, I was just all about like being at a good club that looked like they want to do stuff. And, you know, luckily we did. And, and luckily I was able to play a bit of part in that. And, and we had a bit of fun along the way as well. Brilliant. And um, <laughs> I don't know whether I'm going to sort of copy and paste some of the shit that's going on here on the side, Jack. It's probably part of the questions I'm asking. Uh, that's what you see. I was giggling away the It doesn't look like you're on the toilet at all, brother. It doesn't look like you're on the toilet at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, I then open it up again because I'm trying to keep a straight face. <laughs> Maybe this is the giggle. So, um, but for Don first and then Ian, when when you came into the team, what was it like? Sort of, you know, from the legacy that had already started to being built, you know, as 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 a, as a legacy club, as a family club. Uh, Don, how was how was you? What what was it like coming into that? Was it very apparent that that's what had been built and you inculcated early on, or? Yeah, um, to be honest, before I came over, I, I probably had a very, very fresh perspective. Um, I didn't really watch much English rugby. I think I watched 10 minutes of like Leicester versus Wasps in a final in the rain. And I was like, oh, that looks crap. And then change the channel. Um, but, you know, like I, I didn't watch much rugby. And then when I got a phone calls and stuff and interest, then you, you ask people that know about Chiefs um, what, what their reputation is like. And it was very much um, a, a nice, like a good club for having a good culture. Guys work hard, but, you know, it's, it's, it's there about making memories and having fun. Um, and that was at the stage that they were at. Uh, when I arrived, I pretty much <clears throat> walked down to the, the bottom field, which is now a parking lot, um, which I think had a had some funny smelling like liquid running down to it. Um, and the boys were doing three on three warm up drill where you just do hands. Um, and Lloyd brother, uh, Lloyd Fairbrother was a, was a prop that was there at the time, uh, the mullet. And he got past the ball and he dropped it, laughed, ran to pick it up, uh, and kicked it. And everyone just laughed. And I was like, oh, what's <laughs> that's interesting. Um, cause I'd come from like stormers where everything was serious and we do like, 50 yep. meter part three on three passing and you've been told that if it's not going like hip height all the way right to the hands that you've got to do 
I don't know, you've got to improve your attitude and all this kind of thing. And I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. But it's obviously that that was uh, that was the fun side of it that showed. Um, guys were very welcoming. And it was literally all about the fans loving it and, and what you could do. Um, you know, fast forward a couple of years. And like Phil said earlier, they weren't in any rush to try and get to the top in two years. It was about building the foundations, um, which I'm pretty sure everyone's aware that Rob never went away from working hard. Um, and that's still one that he'll that he'll push through today. Um and that's kind of thing what's 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 made it's what's made Chief's journey so far successful and it won't just be a flash in the pan kind of success. Yeah, it's brilliant mate. And interesting that um, because one of the things that um when we talked to Finn Russell last week on the show, it was the difference between Scottish rugby and where he is in France now where nothing against Scottish rugby but the clubs he was with. But in France, they're told that basically they're, they're enjoying themselves on the training pitch and they're having a bit of crack. And that carries on to almost the, the, the style of game that they're allowed to play. It's more more fluid, and more open. It's not as, you know, serious in, in, in the manner. So it's it, that adapting for you coming in like that is, uh, I, I can only imagine. Um, Ian, um, apart from a story that you've got to tell later, um, I just, I'm just going to keep flashing up to the inside chat at the moment and see what's going on. Apart from the story which you've got to tell later, according to Stino, we'll come back to that though. I'm um, coming from, uh, I don't miss anything, lads, and I'm in control, so it's it's great. Um, the uh, Stino, keep going, mate. Keep, tell 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 me stuff, mate, and I'll share it out, mate. It's not a problem. I'll force these lads into telling me stuff. Wow. They'll they'll be the first to to tell one about you, uh, Ian. Uh, when you came across from uh, Northern Ireland, um, how did you find sort of coming into the club in comparison to what you had sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, bolstering in the north? Uh, I think similar to what the lads said, there, um, there's more, there's a big enjoyment factor about the place. So, you know, there was a big thing, emphasis put on having fun and, and enjoying rugby. And I think coming from Ulster where it's always a wee, well, I don't know what it's like now, but it was always a bit, super serious you know we have to win every match it was a bit more i'm not going to say light-hearted but it was, it's, it's, it, was, it was it was always you know you, you you work hard and enjoy yourself at exeter and to be fair they've kept that going as time's gone on there's still the enjoyment factor there there's still um you know have fun at the right times but at, gradually as things have gone on it's become a wee bit more serious in terms of look lads we've the potential to do big things here so let's make sure we knuckle down and do it and then we can celebrate big victories rather than, than celebrating every match it became we'll celebrate big victories and i think as time's moved on that's the way things have gone mm -hmm. kind of thought was it like sort of um coming into a club like exeter because it's it's um, um a, a fair number of the players over the years as fair to say have come from the local region um it, it, does that does that help make a club like exeter you know more family orientated the, the focus a little bit more was that to me yeah sorry make it yeah kind of you. yeah no it is i suppose yeah like at the minute i suppose um when i came in there was there was um there was a lot of guys were brought in from all around um the local area so that was that first initial bit um and now what we're seeing now is we're we're seeing kids who want to you know play for extra chiefs like I think the guys that are all sitting here at the minute, um, you have to um, understand that they, they've come in to the environment, whereas now we're getting homegrown players who are actually wanting to grow up and play for the club, which is great. You know, when you're talking about that family environment, it's very much created for people whenever they come. So it is good. Uh, the culture is good at the minute and hopefully it can continue, especially, you know, where, where the club's going at the minute. Brilliant. Um, right. All of you have got to tell one story about the other. Uh, at some point tonight, so um, I'll uh, well, let's start off with uh, uh, Phil. Tell me a story about Don Armand. Oh, he's cleaning the Wait a long time there, mate. I'm a, yeah. He's cleaning the <laughs> Good clean. luck. Um, Good luck, Tully. Uh, to be fair, there's not there's not too many stories I can recollect that are healthy enough to go out on air. Um, <laughs> we, had, we had a good we had a good few socials. I remember. Um, just make one up as long as it's funny. I think I remember you doing like an upside down pint, some pint. Was that your your initiation or something? We can't talk um, about that. <laughs> Surely you can't remember back that far, Phil. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. No, I, I've got a real strong memory of initiations apart from the last one. 
I can't remember a thing past probably 6 p.m. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a I'm sort of 24 hours ago. We'll go back then to, uh, we'll go back on to um, uh, um, hobbies later on. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, Gareth, you've got a bit of porn or something in the background. I'm seeing a bit of shadow. Have I? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't have any of that, unfortunately. Oh, nice chair he's got in the background, though, isn't it? Look at that. <laughs> yeah, I've got a nice Ooh. chair, though. Yeah, yeah, nice chair. So, the uh, the club itself, what what makes it uh, feel for you the, 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 the club that it is? I mean, why has it um, managed to build? You know, said at the beginning there, it's sort of year on year. I'm saying that, you know, you're just building sort of slowly. For me, it's almost like, you know, there was no... No massive amounts of money thrown at it like certain other clubs. Uh, it's almost like you sort of just come in stealthily at the side, and you could see where it was going. Where it was going to grow. Um, that that week on week, season on season thing is. Does that help a club build its foundations? You know, more securely than maybe some other clubs who, you know, maybe want to achieve uh, success. For yeah, more? yeah, I think it it did. I think. Um... Never trying to overreach was probably something that happened in those early years. We didn't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We actually put in some hell of performances in the early early years in the Premiership, and actually, you know, we surprised a few people, which was which was fantastic as a player. But probably the 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 leading force for me has to be the players, and you know, I would say that because I'm the player, and I felt like that was that was the main focus for me as a player. But you know, you've got to give credit to the coaches and the backroom staff who kind of give us the environment and give us the plan. And they sit there and they kind of look at the overall picture. But then it's up to the players then to kind of pick it up, put their energy into it. And, you know, we're lucky enough to have like a real good core of senior players each year that kind of drive that within the squad. But then the players themselves all got to buy into it. And, and they're the ones that really drive the standards. You know, they, the coaches and everyone set the tone. But then, if you know, you've got to get that buy-in from the players. And I think that we've been lucky that the mix of squads that we've had over the years have been good people, all prepared to buy in for each other and, and to do the work. And, you know, it's just, no one gets ahead of themselves. Anyone who's kind of puts their head above the parapet gets shot down quite easily, you know, and, it, and, and you get brought back in line. And I think um, if, you don't, if you don't fall in line, you kind of, you don't last too long. So... You know, it is driven by the players, you know, in the change room. That's 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 the most important factor for me. Um, but we're obviously led by the, the back room and, and the coaches and Rob. And um, we're very lucky to have those guys as well. Brilliant. Ian, for, for you, having um, someone like Rob there, oh, 26 years, man and boy, you know, and that sort of almost stability, uh, binding that. And no doubt there's a whole pile of the back room staff there as well. Um does that help with the style of club that it is that that makes it more successful? It makes it feel, you know, you, the, there's not as much, maybe there's not pressure on coaches and coming in sort of, you know, a couple of years at a time and then the results aren't there. I suppose it's easy when you're building the results and you are winning, but having that sort of environment where you've got stability, how important is that to, to a club? Oh, well, yeah, I think Rob Rob's always, you know, Obviously, being from the southwest, is he's always sort of keen to stress, you know, about how how we're representing an area, you know, sort of hotbed of rugby in England. I think as well, you know, you, you talk about that as well. Uh, the good times, also, there, there's been tough times for the club, or well, not tough times, but there's been bad results. I remember, um, we lost to Salem, sort of my second year here. We lost by fifty points at home. I remember Rob coming into the changing rooms afterwards and basically saying, oh, that was unacceptable, lads. Every single one of you is get your suit on, go up into the main bar of the stand and, you know, start telling the supporters how sorry you are. You served that up today. Like, nice. so he's always, there's always been sort of a connection there through Rob, really, to the local area that you know that, you know, you're representing sort of a proud area for rugby and, and, and people are, right behind you and and you've sort of don't let them down that kind of way you know play for them as well as yourself and i think that that's always sort of been in the background of everything he's really said to us hmm. is it is it one of those things where um it's quickly moved on from so you say if, if something hasn't gone really well it's dealt with abruptly in a in a positive sort of you know 
positive advice and encouragement style of way by Rob and the rest of the coaching team. And then it's that's it. Next, it's gone. You moved on and you learn from it. Is that sort of type of environment rather than the, um, you know, right, we're, we're going to sort of drill back down into this over and over a bit. Nothing against the Stormers, but Don was saying where you've got that more serious approach. Is it sort of short and sharp? Learn from it, lads, move on, and then go to the next stuff. Ian, we'll stay with you. Um, yeah, there's not, don't get me wrong, if, if we have a bad days, we talk about it. And sometimes on a Monday, we can talk about it for a very long time. But mm. at the end of the day, would, there's decisions made, decided upon, and come next Saturday, yeah, we've all got clear heads and we're all ready to go again. I don't think, he's not a massive man for talking about things. Things are put to bed. It might take a while to put things to bed, but to put to bed and then come mm. back. You know, he's, he, you know, you're trying to free yourself up to, to just because at times as well, don't forget, you know, we've gone through seasons where we've had eight or ten losing matches in a row. I think I remember one season we lost ten in a row at one point, and then <coughs> we were able to put that behind us. And by the end of the, we finished second in the league that year, I think, and then we won the final against Wolves. I think that was year we lost about ten games at the start, almost in a row. So I think. Um, I think I was injured then, man. <laughs> oh, wow. Bill <laughs> came back and he picked up and the rest of it. Like, so. Steer the ship. <laughs> just in time to be able to kill it. The saviour is here. The saviour is here. Hallelujah. What's, um, what, what's it like from a, from a leadership point of view? Obviously, you've got a club captain. Uh, you presumably stand stuff, you know, you've got a sort of pack leader, you know, somebody controls the back. But what's it like um, for, in, a, in a training and in a general club environment for, for leadership? Is is the same sort of um, off-field leadership responsibilities and those taking ownership responsibilities for those as there is on-field? How does it work with Exeter? Yeah, there's, there's loads of leaders within the group, I suppose, um, and it's changed throughout the years. Um, mm. You know, and they're, they're quite good at... Um, bringing young fellas into the group who potentially could be, you know, maybe not potentially a captain, but in certain positions in the field, if you take a 10, for instance, it's a natural position to be a leader, um, you know, nines, pack leaders, all these sorts of things. So um, we're very good at bringing guys in to basically challenge them to be leaders. And But it's, it's ultimately, you know, you know, it's not two or three blokes doing this. There's at least, there's 10 guys there who could basically run that ship um you know we've guys who could step in and cap on the side at the blink of an eye um which makes the whole thing really you know positive we've got guys we've got social leaders we've got you know mm. rugby leaders we've got right across the board so um i think it's good the dynamics we have at the minute and uh yeah it's it's definitely pays dividends on a saturday afternoon or a sunday afternoon whenever it comes to play Brilliant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to tonight's show. It's Three Blokes of Ball and Bard from the Three Bard Rugby Group uh, on our Exeter Chiefs special. Looking at the 10 year journey, I'm joined tonight by Phil Dolman, by Don Armand, who's a flanker, not a centre, and <laughs> by Ian Witten. I'll never forget that one. I'll never forget that one. I'll tell you some kind of thing. Second row these days. Oh, uh, yes. Second row these days. He's looking fit and healthy enough that he could be. Uh, so there you go. And the uh, the great Mr. Gabbard Um Okay, so. Um, who have we got on tonight? Stu Corsa, uh, great to uh, see you on from Big Red Rugby up there in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, great to see you, brother. It must be in touch soon. I uh, played with Stu, boy. Huh? I, I played with Stu back in the Rotherham day. So, how are you getting on, Stu? Oh, the Titans, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good yeah. man, isn't he? Really, really good man, and uh, doing great stuff there with Big Red. We had him, we had him on uh, last year on the show. We got to get him back on again in sort of uh, early 21. Uh, James Overton's on watching. Uh, fantastic! Fan fa can't even say it. Fascinating. <laughs> uh, two things. I should have. I should have more beer, shouldn't I? <laughs> fascinating podcast. Loving this. Uh, Dave Topping. Uh, just an, uh, alluding there to the fact that um, may be coming a Freeman uh, and uh, be driving a sheep. Uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Gareth, I think. Who else have we got on? Uh, Darren Vincent's on. Uh, good mate. How's it, Darren? Yeah. Schoolmate, mate. Man, continue for ages. Joe Lyons is on from Ireland. Uh, was there for the 2017-18 European uh, Rugby Cup game, hand on heart, 
Uh, the fans, locals, everyone was so welcome. A lovely place and so much respect for the home fans. And yes, we still won. Uh, must be an Irish thing, mate. Uh, Ian Gilbert, our ambassador extraordinary to uh, from three blokes to Madrid. Hola, Ian. A big fan of Ryan Caldwell, uh, Chief 2014-15. We saw a lot of him at schoolboy level, famously punched by Paul O'Connell at an island training session. There you go. The stories and everything from the back, from the back in the uh, days. Renan Stenerkamp, one of our team from our Springbok and South African rugby show there. Uh, Exeter has become a giant, um, even everybody from a summery South Africa. Yeah, don't be telling me it's 38, 39 degrees uh, again. Uh, lad, you're all welcome to uh, the show tonight. If you've got any questions for... Uh, Gareth for Ian for uh, Don or for Phil, then please uh, stick them up. Uh, Gregor Galway, who is up there, one of our white walkers up in the north there. Great fans. Uh, was that the Ulster Chiefs uh, away game? Um, even offered the uh, Korean rice. There you, go. you can't beat that, can you? Here we go. Okay. So, highs and lows. Ian Witten, what's been the highest point of your time with the Chiefs so far? Uh, I think when the European Cup, like, it's hard to get past that you know that's the top of the tree best best you can do in club rugby like so i think just you know that feeling of having won that trophy you know running on the pitch at the end dancing like a man man in a stadium with nobody in it that's <laughs> still the high point for me like yeah absolutely uh good um don high point for you uh, probably also I I didn't play it, but I was in, sure. for some reason it was just fantastic. It was the it was the double, um, winning the the European Cup obviously was massive, and then another massive effort going in the following week to to back that up and in horrible conditions and again if we went either way, um, and just the whole couple of weeks pre and couple of weeks post that it was just a like those are the weeks that I'll never forget. Um, those are like memories that'll be made. Those are things you can't see on the field and. Yeah, there's I did it the right way. Um, like we got to win the premiership again and I didn't really celebrate it well enough the first time. So you know, that was yeah, it was it was a really great high for me. Brilliant. Phil. Um, yeah, same really. I think um just being involved in the squad really and just being around the guys as they kind of progressed through that end of season was just fantastic. You know, the way the boys went around knocking off all these top teams, you know big finals i think you know that premiership final where with where the boys went up and beat wasps in an awful awful weather you know everything was against us they kind of brought a massive lever into the game but boys stuck at it after a big week before as well it was yeah it's just fantastic to watch it um yeah and just to be involved with the boys over the next couple of days and just enjoy you know enjoy each other's company and kind of reminisce all, on the year although it's been not great off the pitch. It's probably, mm. you know, to be involved in it, it's been the best season I've ever been involved in. And luckily enough, you know, I got that opportunity. Um, so it's fantastic. Brilliant. Stino, you've had lots of highs, like like most rugby players, but you know, how does the uh how does the double this year com compare to maybe winning the first uh champion winning the first premiership, um, or even scored on twenty four out of twenty nine points against Bristol? To, to put you up there in the first place what, what's what how do you measure your highs um difficult i have to be absolutely honest um i i remember back, being back like i said at the start it was like every step seemed to be the right time um and i've been quite fortunate to be there to see it and the same with phil we've been quite fortunate to be there to see basically all of them um and that championship final um, was brilliant from the fact that not because there were so many, you know, I was fortunate enough to knock a few points over. It was just the whole build up to it, the whole anticipation of getting promotion and, you know, doing something that the club had never ever done. Now, thankfully, you know, we've been quite fortunate to be part of a lot of firsts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we've done most firsts that you can possibly do. Um, but it was, they're very mm -hmm. difficult. I have to say, like, in terms of winning a double, um, you know, albeit I didn't get on the field for the games, but I was involved in the 23, was pretty special because I knew that I was finishing. So it was kind of like, it just was like, I'll be honest, it kind of was written in the stars for me. I was kind of thinking, oh, this is the, my absolute fairy tale. I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to go around and think it, but 
I always had it in the back of my head this was gonna be it. Um, you know, and it just seemed to fall into place for me. But in terms of highs, just in something completely different. Um, one of the highest points in my career as a chief is a loss. And it was a loss in Belfast because it was that I got to go home and captain Exeter Chiefs on a Saturday night in the Heineken Cup against Ulster, who had told me, give me such bad news all those years ago. And I remember going home and people saying to me, you're still playing rugby. Oh, who are you playing rugby for? And there we were on a Saturday night, taking lumps out of them and almost beating them with two minutes to go. And honestly, the best kick I ever hit in my career was a drop goal at Belfast when I thought we was going to win. Because the hairs in the, that was the only time the hairs in the back of my neck stood up in my entire playing career. Now, sure enough, Paddy Jackson had a kick after, but <laughs> it still would go down as one of the. Like, I'm th- talking about it now, and I'm still getting goosebumps. So yeah. that's just the feeling of that. So um, that's a completely different kind of high. Yeah, but 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 it's still a high, isn't it? Sometimes you can take away um, stuff as stuff from losses that that you just feel that oh, look could have been on there for three days. It was just never meant to be. Uh, there's no thing, but it's a fascinating insight. What um what in fact question? If I'll come back to my question in a minute, but question here from Joe Lyons: uh, Premiership or uh, EPC or EPC or the the European uh, title uh, in Witten? What, what's what's more special for you, or is winning any trophy just as good? Uh, oh, they're they're definitely both good. Um, don't get me wrong; the Premiership's very, very hard to win, <clears throat> as we've discovered over the years. We've had plenty of disappointments in the Premiership, but I think Europe, obviously, because of the different nations involved, also the fact that we've done so badly in Europe over the years. I mean, we really, really struggled to get out of the group. I had some really pretty awful defeats just last year to get it so right um, to be beaten to lose and racing um, Lara Shell away you know winning all those big games and putting a real run together I mean that's a great feeling and the, the excitement of playing in Europe for me has always been the ultimate experience in, in playing club rugby and I think you know to win the European Cup is is the best for me anyway i think uh, i think people were beginning to wonder whether exeter would become almost like the claim on the nearly men so close such a class team great players and yet you know when it came down to it because it just seemed to be growing and growing success 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 in the premiership and it just there was just something that was just stopping you at a point um, and i think genuinely this year th- there wasn't anybody that, that didn't really want you to to, to win it um, certainly, when when, when Leinster went out, was was only one team for me to win it genuinely. Um, so it was uh, um, uh, that was really good. Phil, uh, where do you rate the Premiership against the likes of the Pro 14 or the Top 14? You play teams from all all of those, but where do you think the you know because there's always a new point about you know the 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 the, uh, the Pro 14 really is only based around there's only three or four good clubs and. Well, actually, I think the Premiership is quite hard. It, it always seems to be a little bit more open than maybe the top 14 or the pro 14. But w- what's your thoughts on it? Um, well, I suppose it's difficult with it when you're not when you're not in both camps. But um, certainly from, you know, as, as far as the league structure goes, I think it's it makes it a lot harder. Be, you know, all 12 teams... It's 12, isn't it? All 12 teams are trying to knock lumps out of each other all year round. There's no kind of rest bites. There's no rest weeks where people are kind of swapped out. You know, large portions of squads are swapped out and two sides go against each other with half a team, which from my experience when I was in uh, playing for the Dragons, that happened quite a lot. You know, I, we would be often be sent out to Munster with a, you know, squad a, average age of 22, 23. And, you know, sent to the Wolves a little bit. But, it was, you know, as far as it's concerned, it was a great learning experience. And I was chuffed to be on the pitch. But, um, you know, you, you rarely get that in the Premiership. You have you know, your likes of Worcester, you're not going to go away and have a nice, easy Worcester game. You're not going to go away and have a nice, easy Newcastle game, as you see this year. There's, there's a hard game every week. And you've got to turn up every week and put, and put a decent performance out just to kind of continue the form and, and, to, con- and to continue getting points. And I think... 
you know, you just you just see the way the top four, top six changes every year in the Premiership. It's not the same six teams no. top in the league. Um, and for a long time, I think you see that in the in the Pro 14. You know, there's there's a few real top top sides there, especially the Irish sides who kind of take control of it. Um, and you just don't see that in the Premiership. Mm, absolutely, um, Don. Difference between I sent about hundred groups, right? And and there's always this viewpoint uh, about Northern and Southern Hemisphere, and we're going to see soon because obviously with the four South African teams uh, joining uh, the Pro 12 as it is now um, for next season, we believe. So, but from your perce perce perception, you know, Western Province and the Stormers coming up, playing at Exeter, um, playing for England as well. Is there a chasm? Is there a gap, or is it just that it's different styles of play and it's different uh, weather conditions, and therefore that dictates the style of play? What, what does it say for you? Uh, I'd I'd say when I came over, I always thought that Super Fifteen or the, the the South African teams probably had an edge, but they had a whole country into four teams, and they were being judged. So you had the four best teams with the, the best players that are possibly available playing um so it wasn't just style of rugby it was like if you looked at that storm side when i came over there was what, 10 to 12 spring box on that side um and then there'd be a, a bull side that had the, uh, another 10 to 12 and then you'd have cheaters so like you just had a lot of international current internationals playing for each team and it just had a high standard Whereas now I think it's a bit more diluted, but I think that the style of rugby probably comes into play a bit more than the names that are playing it. And I, I, I don't know, I think Prem has kind of stepped it up a bit, whereas I feel it's like the South African teams probably have, have, have gone away from it a bit. And just you can see it by how inconsistent they are with their results. You, know, you get bulls that, that have Jake White coming in, they have some good games, but then they also lose games that you're just like, how, how are they losing those games? Um, whereas Prem, yes you do get games that guys lose, but on the whole, you can kind of tell which team should be winning games or where, where it kind of lands. But it, it, I mean, still highly competitive, but you know, I, I, I don't know. I think Prem's kind of getting a, a level of consistency, which, which bodes into them being a strong competition. Hmm. Brilliant. What's, um, it, it's been a difficult year this year. We just heard that sort of championship rugby is coming back, um, but, but with adapted rules, um, do you see the, the Premiership in the future sort of almost going into uh, if the way life is at the moment? Could you ever see it, uh, Gareth, going into, um, but like the Pro 14's got, we've got two conferences, so almost separating the sort of the, the North and the South. Would, would that help things uh, for, for, for feeding for clubs from more local than global type approach? I don't know if it would go North and South, if I'm being honest. I, I can see a ring fencing i can see that happening um just with like you just said in terms of uh well you know the times we're living in at the minute and the way the, the championship sort of is um and what clubs could potentially move up into the premiership you know they've got to have the 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 grounds and everything in place to do that and uh as much as i would not want to see that happening because of the product that we we are but technically you know, if there was a ring fence and there would be no extra chiefs and you would never want to take that away from a club who has ambition. Um, you know, you could literally, you know, I think we were four leagues down at one stage, extra chiefs, you know, so why take that opportunity away from some clubs who have got dreams and ambitions? And, you know, if you get the right infrastructure in place, you know, you can achieve things. Um, but unfortunately in the times we're living in it is a realistic possibility that that could happen now albeit it might happen for a couple of seasons um which might be good for the game to try and sustain but i would be very much hoping that we can keep that pr that promotion relegation thing um and but in terms of the north south thing as well i just i can't see how how we how we do it really that that's my impact i'd hate not to see rugby in you know, in Newcastle or in Manchester, you know, we've got to keep growing the game. Yeah, we do. I agree. Uh, and I am a, I'm a big fan of uh, a lot of local clubs feeding all the way through. So, you know, it's like, if it, you know, sort of, um, it's almost like you, you have a club affiliation. In fact, do you have that? In, in like Leinster, for example, they have a local club affiliation for each player. 
you, you have that where you you could a bit like Dan Carter went for for South well, South South Southland, isn't it? Um, do you have a, a a lower club affiliation that you were with, or do you not have that? In the it wouldn't be it wouldn't be like um, the, the sort of thing you're explaining there. I, that's similar to what we would have grown up with me and Ian when our, I'm sure Phil was the same exactly. uh, in Wales, where you would have an actual club that you were affiliated. I was affiliated on Gannon. Um, Ian would have been balling a hinch. Um, and you know, so I think now it's more for young fellas who get the opportunity to go and play. So, we our loan sort of clubs would have been traditionally Plymouth Albion or Cornish Pirates, where we would get our young fellas who get the opportunity to go and just play. Um, because it's very important for their development at that stage, or guys who aren't getting a lot of rugby maybe slide down, get a couple of games here and there. Um, but in terms of you know that junior club, because you know the standard of of the junior clubs around us really realistically are quite low down in comparison to the premiership um you know we don't really have guys sent to that i think the lowest is maybe taunton a few over there so um but uh yeah that's where we're at sidma throw is looking out for some good players mine forgot about <laughs> sidma yeah they need a full, they need a fullback i have. yeah they do good one yeah. <laughs> top coach though top coach top coach <laughs> Well, Ian, how does um, how can other clubs learn from the uh, the Exeter journey? Because, like I say, I mean, it's not you know it's not both smoke or Exeter or any of you, are, but it, it is a remarkable journey through all of those stages and through on a, a ten year. And because this question leads me on to at least to something else, but how do you um, what can what can clubs learn from what you've done and how you've done it? Don't tell them, in. No secret. Yeah, I'll be careful. I am. Just talking now. I think a big thing about what Extra do is they're prepared to back their own. Um, they've certainly backed uh, their young gen. Well, they're not as young as they were now. I suppose they backed the generation of academy players to produce for them. You know, your Dickies, your Jack Knowles, your Henry Slades. Now they're all amazing players, but the club were prepared to back them. And I think that sometimes um, in professional clubs, they're not prepared to back guys to produce themselves. They'll just go and buy whoever, you know, yeah. and get them in. But I think, uh, you know, there's a core of boys there in our squad that are, are from, you know, the local rugby in the Southwest brought up through that. And I think that's a big help to Exeter. And I think as well, you know, if you're, Building obviously, you know, we have had, you know, sort of the big name signings, you your Stuart Hogs, your Dean Mums, uh, as as you've gone along. But he's also been prepared to look in the championship, to look at in uh, other other countries and find guys that maybe are under the radar a wee bit as well. And I think he guys like that have helped him too, you know, and then now he's been able to add, you know, your Stuart Hogs and your Johnny Grays and boys like that on top of it. So I think the key thing is probably not to just try and buy a team. He, he, he's probably built slowly and, and smartly. Like. Superb. Um, Don, we started the season off well uh, again now. Where, where do you think Exeter to go from here? How, how easy is it to, to, to keep, and um, you know, Building that legacy, I mean, there's nowhere else really for you to go. Um, but so, we're next two to five years, what what keeps a team like Exeter on the top? I suppose we'll find out in a couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, it's obviously a challenge because it's all uncharted territory in mm. terms of the club, the mentality of the like every year we've gone through. The the coaches have kind of. Because I mean, they obviously set the mentality, intensity, and that kind of thing, and feed it down, and 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 everyone picks up on it. But you know, they've you look at our previous years. Uh, we've all always learned from how the seasons ended, whether it's losing a final, winning a final, and then gone and learned from that, and and moved on the next season. Um, so this is very much a we're going to do something, and at the same time learn from it because we're going to have to do this again in the future, if that makes sense. Sure. And kind of know that what we're doing is the right thing, um, but still learning, not thinking it's the only thing, if that makes sense. I, I, yeah. So we obviously want to go after it again. That's that's the only thing you can do is go after it and defend your title that you've you've got. 
Um, and it's not about being complacent. It's not about avoiding the complacency. Like we haven't really chatted much about avoiding just just being happy with what we've done. It's more just been about going after it again. Um, so it's kind of like it's we're not we're not trying to avoid the negative. We, we're chasing a positive again, which I think is is quite key because we want it. We want to win it again. You have got guys that are hungry because um, <clears throat> there's a lot of guys that weren't involved in that because our, our our team our 23 is pretty consistent for the last couple of weeks, um, and I think that's where you you kind of got to play on it and get the guys that kind of tasted the the what the glory was like without being fully involved, thinking I want that putting them in and making them push for place. Um, and I probably think the, the internal competition will probably be the way forward. Uh, and, I've, and our guys, I know notoriously respond very well to internal competition. That's, that's got us where we've got to today. Um, and yeah, I, I think apart from that, there's, there's not much else that, that can be written down in a formula and said, go this way and it'll work. So yeah, it'll be an interesting season ahead. Absolutely. I'm, I'm um, just about to pick up a copy of uh, Robert Kitson's X-Men. So I'm quite looking forward to, uh, to to reading that and sort of finding out a little bit more about some of the things we haven't been able to cover tonight or I couldn't find out. Um, so what about the future? Uh, Gareth Steenson, you're a busy man. Um, what's the future hold for you? What, what do you see uh, the next couple of years for you? What, what are you hoping for? For me personally, it's, uh, you know, obviously going into the coaching setup is kind of just, you know, learning. You know, I'm very much a novice now in the office. Um, you know, and I'm sure the guys will probably say it to you as well. Over the first month, I've been pretty poor. But, uh, you know, it's about trying to just learn as I go. Um, you know, I want to be successful, obviously. I want to hopefully give my knowledge as much as I possibly can to a lot of the younger guys coming through, you know, right th even through to the women's setup as well. We have now a chief. So, you know, I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, um, you know, and I think that it'd be great that if, if the club can go forward. And for me, I'd love to be part of a coaching team that wins another double, you know, so that would be a completely brand new thing for me. And, um, you know, that's what I want to be part of. So I'd be doing everything I can to help the guys as best I can to, to achieve that. Absolutely. It must be. I mean, and there's not many people that do that. It must be a fantastic thing. You know, it's like saying for Leo Cullen, it, you know, this going from uh, the top of the shop as a player and achieving what you've done to uh, going to uh, to that as um, as a coach as well. Uh, <laughs> he is a busy man indeed. Uh, cool. So, uh, Phil Dolman, what about your future, mate? What, what's, what's the whole for you in the next couple of years, apart from the new coaching gig? Um, yeah, yeah, a bit of coaching. I'm, I'm the lucky one. I get to kind of sit back and watch these boys do their thing now. I get to uh, sit on the sofa, criticize the lads, pretend I was, I've been there, done it, go to the yeah. pub and be that annoying bloke in the corner. You know what I mean? It's like I get, I get that chance to do that. Um, now, luckily, the real world's, real world's upon me already. So I'm working with um, a company called Thrifty down here. Um, Luckily, doing a bit of sports stuff with those guys, so keeping my toe in with the sports environment, and um, it's been fun. It's been it's been complete shell shock, you know. It's kind of completely different to what I'm used to as a rugby player, but I feel like I'm doing all right. I hope I'm doing all right. I hope I'm doing look like a fool in the office, but it's a bit of a different environment. But um, finding uh, they won't, they won't tell you if you are. Nah, they tell me about a year's time, sir. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, some bloke called Jack Knowles on, has Ian spoken yet? Yeah, uh, Jack. Aaron. Uh, so, but Ian, he says, there we go. He's got, he's got a great story he wants to talk about, though, Jack. Yeah, he's got a great story he needs to tell before he goes. Uh, I don't know. I'm not <laughs> no, 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 Stories best kept, uh, like like being in the forces, lad. Stories best kept for uh, when you're in the bar in Gareth's place. We'll come, come across one day and then oh, yeah. come out there. That's probably the yeah. best way. Once you're back open again. Once you're back open again, absolutely. Once you're back open again. So. Yeah, yeah. Look, it'll all return. It'll all be good, lads. It will all be good. So, uh, Ian Witten, what about uh, good start to the season for you? You know, what are you hoping for in the next sort of year or so for yourself personally? Um, oh, I don't know. Haircut. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I don't know if I older like to set myself too many targets. I just try and stay fit, try and stay involved in the team, and then we'll see how we go from there. You know, have to 
doesn't get any easier as you get older. You've got to fight hard to stay fresh. So that'll be the key thing, staying fresh this season. It's going to be, like you say, 30-odd weeks in a row. Uh, staying fresh will be a big thing and, and just, you know, keep pushing to, to be involved and hopefully we can have big games at the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, lads, I, uh, that's an hour, uh, so it's time to wrap up, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, huge, I'm just, <laughs> following, God, I'm just following the last little bits of the... Uh, of the uh, Don's the, doing uh, nothing for three years then. <laughs> 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 well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I think, it, in fact, there is, one, there is one final question. What's it, what's it uh, Stina, what's the difference between sort of um, in big championship games between... What does the crowd really do to not having a crowd? Uh, you know, I can't really imagine what that must be like. So, really, Gareth, we'll start with you just to finish off with. Well, how did you find it? How, how, as a player, do you lift yourself in that type of environment? Or was it easy to switch off and it's just the game you're focusing on? Uh, I suppose, you know, recently um, it has literally just been the guys in the field. So, and the good thing is as well, when we've played at home, especially, we've had the, the non-23, anybody who hasn't played in the game, they're there in the crowd. And actually, you know, they, they, they're quite inspiring. They make plenty of noise as much as they possibly can. Um, I suppose the biggest shock's probably going to be whenever people come back because, you know, we haven't played in front of a crowd now since March or, you know, February, whatever it was. So um, it's going to be interesting for the guys whenever we actually get a crowd in. We're very excited about getting people back in as well because, you know, They've probably they've missed out on some of the biggest days uh, the club has seen, unfortunately, over the last little while. So hopefully next year they'll get to experience it all again for the second time round. Yeah, good. Well, listen, lads, we wish you all the very, very best. It's uh, been a pleasure having you on. <laughs> pleasure listening to the side chat, uh, reading a little side chat there. To everybody who's watched this tonight, uh, thanks very much. You've been most welcome to Three Blokes of Ball and Bard. As ever, come and join us. We're not allowed to use the L or follow it. Facebook doesn't like that. But come and join us at uh, Three Blokes of Ball and Bard for all the latest updates and lives. We've got a whole pile. We've got five or six shows uh, next week. So there's a whole pile of stuff happening there as well. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Phil Dolman, Don Arman, Ian Witten, and Kat Steenson for your time tonight. Uh, scratch the scratch the scratch on the service. Uh, me thinks about um, Exeter Rugby. Uh, I do uh, I do look forward to uh, reading the book, um, uh, The Exeter Men by Robert Cutson, and see where we get from there. But uh, wish you all the best, lads, uh, for the rest of the season and for uh, your new projects and ongoing projects and the new coaching stuff and bar opening up again and you know for playing lads uh, stay safe uh, i know it could be a relatively short career it is great too genuinely to see uh, to see a club go from something to the very very top of the shop in a, in a 10-year journey um i've been big joe Shep, gareth phil don and ian thanks very much for staying in the studio when we close down and we'll see you all again soon lads thanks very much uh lads uh, everybody's been watching uh, there's just one final uh, message obviously i get uh, messages on here i get tons and tons and tons of here and so to uh, the one over for jared uh just to allay any fears mate it is a whiskey tumbler but it's only beer mate it's a, it's a posh beer on a uh, on a wednesday night mate. even i can't suck whiskey that fast anyway there we go um, until next uh, Monday show, which is the Keegan Big Joe show, I've been Big Joe oh. Chef, and uh, thanks very much for supporting us on everything we have done. Until then, stay safe, wash your hands. Got a minute, Mahogatagas, Langafall. <laughs>